Hello, Phil258 Life and Death students. In this video lecture, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, materialism, materialism about the human person, and this view last time that we called basic materialism. A big part of the research agenda these days associated with materialism involves the nature of the mind or mentality uh, on a materialist perspective, and I'm not really going to go into that in detail. I talked about that in the last video uh, for a little bit at the end, but that part I'm not really going to go into now. Um, last time we talked a little bit, or I talked a little bit, about uh, some support for basic materialism, and this involved uh, certain problems for dualism, um, and materialism being the, the alternative, and um, various issues having to do with the progress of science, especially mind-brain correlations, and we considered um, a specific argument in favor of materialism, um, the mental causation argument, uh, especially uh, due to the, the work of uh, philosopher David Papineau. What I'm going to talk about today are some uh, objections to materialism and some um, possible materialist replies. If you're in my life and death class near the end of this video, I'm going to have a little bit of uh, information for you regarding um, our quiz this week. I think it's going to be um, quiz number seven. So I'm going to get a slideshow started here. Okay. So people who don't like materialism think it's false for one reason or another. Um, have an array of objections against it. Here are two which um, I'm going to suggest are not really, really challenging to materialism, but some people think it's challenged by, by these sorts of problems. Um, in philosophy, there's a problem of personal identity, and uh, the, the basic question is, um, what makes a person at, at one time, let's say the present time, um, the same person as a person at an earlier time, let's say like 10 years ago, right? Why, why are you the same person you were, for example, seven years ago? And um, any theory according to which there exist souls or Cartesian minds has a very easy answer to this question, right? Um, on the Cartesian dualism perspective, you are the same person you were seven years ago simply because you have the exact same soul, which neither gains nor loses parts over time. It, it is um, the same exact thing that it was seven years ago. So um, we might think that the dualist has kind of an easy answer to this question, but if we don't have souls that stay, you know, numerically the same um, over time, it might be a bit harder or more challenging to answer this question. You know, our maybe the cells in our body right now, um, maybe none of the cells in our body right now, or almost none, were present in our body seven years ago. What then makes us the same person as we were seven years ago? Um, some people think that materialism has a problem having to do with consciousness. I'm not so sure this is a big problem for basic materialism, maybe for some other stronger kinds of materialism, which I'm not going to talk about here. Um, but some people ask this question, how can purely physical processes give rise to consciousness, presupposing that you know, this is an impossible question to answer and therefore kind of supports a dualist perspective. On the other hand, the materialist can ask a question like this. How can purely non-physical processes give rise to consciousness? It, it might seem just as mysterious that um, soul stuff or Cartesian mind stuff could produce conscious sensations, um, even more mysterious maybe than the neurons firing could produce conscious sensations. I'll leave it to you to think about whether these are particularly challenging to materialism. Speaking of personal identity, by the way, I'm now... Um, as I, as I talk, 53 years old, and um, there's my high school identification card, uh, which was, uh, that picture was taken in um, September of 1980, I think, when I was 14 years old. And uh, what makes me now the same person as I was then? You know, I have a lot less hair now. I uh, don't particularly look like that. I don't wear that shirt, and so on. Uh, materialists have a, a couple of possible answers to this question. One of them involves, one of them is psychological. 
Um, in fact, I do remember posing for that photo. So the fact that I can remember the experiences of the person you see, um, according to some people, makes it the case that I am the same person as that, that uh, high school freshman that you see there. Um, on some other views, it's simply the gradual changes or the continuity of the body over time. So even if, even if the cells in my current body um, were not in that body of that young man that you see right there, the idea is there was sort of a continuous series of changes over time, and we could track them if we, you know, in principle wanted to. And that's why I'm the same. So the materialist has sort of um, an array of plausible answers to the, the question of personal identity. What I'm going to talk about um, the most today is an objection to materialism involving uh, psychic phenomena. And um, this is sometimes called the, you know, the paranormal, paranormal phenomena. And um, a lot of people, I think, take this to be a very serious uh, objection to materialism. And I would like to spend, whatever, 10, 15 minutes talking about this issue, talking about the argument against materialism, and um, a, a materialist reply to this argument. So I have here a list of um, a few psychic phenomena, and I'm going to go into some more detail in a few minutes. Um, Near-death experiences. These, these are experiences that people have when they're, you know, very, very close to death, and they, you know, they come back to tell of, of the experiences. Um, they often involve um, seeing a light at the end of a tunnel or um, ex experiences as of uh, viewing their body in, in a hospital room, for example, um, from some place above. And there are interesting stories about um, um, people who have had near-death experiences uh, having knowledge that it seems very mysterious that that they could have if they didn't literally you know, go out of their body for a while and see where th certain things were in the operating room and things like that. These are uh, out-of-body experiences in general. Some people call this astral projection is another kind of psychic phenomenon. Um, reincarnation, if it occurs, is a psychic phenomenon. This is sometimes called the transmigration of souls. Um, haunted houses, I just put in there. Um, reincarnation is when, um, presumably, um, someone living a present life kind of remembers living a past life. And that's at least evidence of rein reincarnation. Um, telepathy is uh, communication with another person or knowledge of other events that is um, not gained through a normal, the, the five senses, you know, the normal sensory channels of information. Extrasensory perception is a kind of telepathy, I think is something very, very, very similar. And there are other sorts of psychic phenomena or paranormal phenomena that I'm not, not listing here. So what exactly is the argument against materialism here? Um, well, it's quite simple. We start out with the premise that psychic phenomena occur. OK, and um, yeah, I'll go, I'll go, uh, let's check out a some Wikipedia pages here a little bit. Um, so reincarnation is one of them. Here's the Wikipedia page uh, entry for reincarnation. It's a free encyclopedia. I think we're allowed to look at it. Um, according to Wikipedia, reincarnation is the philosophical or religious concept that the non-physical essence of a living being starts a new life in a different physical form or body after biological death. So that's a psychic phenomenon. It's also called rebirth or transmigration. Um, here's the article on uh, near-death experience. A near-death experience, NDE, is a profound personal experience associated with death or impending death, which researchers claim share similar characteristics. When positive, such experiences may encompass a variety of sensations, including detachment from the body, feelings of levitation, total serenity, security, warmth, the experience of absolute dissolution, the presence of a light. When negative, such experiences may include sensations of anguish and distress. But it seems that these things happen. They occur. Telepathy. Here's um, 
the Wikipedia article on telepathy. Um, purported vicarious transmission of information from one person to another without using any known human sensory channels or physical interaction. Okay, so, you know, these things have Wikipedia entries. Seems reasonable to believe that they occur. Um, but, if they occur, then people have souls. That's the second premise of the argument. If psychic phenomena occur, then people have souls. Well, it seems like these sorts of phenomena could be explained only if we posit or postulate the existence of souls. Let's take another look. Um, reincarnation. Right. Um, the non-physical essence of a living being starts a new life in a different... So how could that occur uh, unless there are souls, right? Um, let's see. Let me, let me go down a little bit here. Um, research into claims of reincarnation. You know, there's some... A psychiatrist e. Ian Stevenson from the University of Virginia Medical School, I think, um, doing a bunch of uh, claims of reincarnation in hopes of providing evidence that it happens. Um, this is based mainly on um, basically, you know, people's memories of past lives and trying to document um, the past lives that were remembered and um, get some evidence for, for genuine reincarnation along those lines. Apparently some people are impressed by this evidence. Um, Near-death experiences, let's see, we could go down a little bit, not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, explanatory models, yeah, people, people do some studies, research, clinical research and studies on near-death experiences. Um, according to one um, model here, um, the most popular interpretation is that the near-death experience is exactly what it appears to be to the person having the experience. The near-death experience would then represent evidence of the supposedly immaterial existence of a soul or mind. Okay, and maybe I won't go into telepathy here. But if this stuff happens, according to premise two, people have souls, which is, um, according to premise two, um, either the best possible explanation of the occurrence of these phenomena, or maybe the only explanation. But of course, if people have souls, then materialism is false. Um, that's an if-then statement, people, right? Um, premise 3 doesn't say that we have souls. It doesn't say that materialism is false. It says if we have souls, then materialism is false. And even materialists have to agree with that, since materialism says that we don't have souls. And this is basically a modus ponens valid argument for the conclusion that materialism is false. It would also falsify the very specific version of materialism that we called basic materialism. Okay, I already talked through some explanations behind these premises, but if you want um, a quick look, remember premise one says that psychic phenomena occur. Well, plenty of generally honest people have reported experienced them. There's a lot of um, empirical evidence that these things happen. Some of you, I don't know, we didn't get a chance to talk about this in class, which is kind of, kind of uh, makes me a little bit sad, but some of you might be among the people. Um, premise two, if you need a little refresher, claimed that if psychic phenomena occur, then people have souls. Okay. Um, why I think that that's correct? Well, souls needed seem to be needed to explain how psychic phenomena occur. How could reincarnation occur without souls, for example? How could even telepathy seems like maybe it's the sort of thing that maybe could be explained without souls, but may, you might think that souls um, make for a more plausible explanation of how it happens. Um, Out-of-body experiences, near-death near -death experiences, souls seem to be needed to explain the, uh, the occurrence of these kinds of phenomena. And premise three is just um, obviously true. Materialism explicitly denies that people have souls. In our basic materialism, this was just part B, claim B of basic materialism. So if we do have souls, materialism is false. Okay, so here are some possible explanations for uh, the premises of the argument from psychic phenomena. Well, I like to give both sides of... Um, most arguments. So we have here an objection to materialism in the, in the form of a formally valid argument against it. 
how might a materialist respond? Well, do you remember way back when, um, in our class, we were talking about um, valid arguments and invalid arguments and fallacies and all that, and one fallacy that we were talking about was called the fallacy of equivocation. Equivocation occurs when a word or phrase has, you, um, has different meanings and it ha undergoes a shift in meaning during the course of an argument. Right? Uh, do you remember that our, our sort of main example of this was an argument, um, man is the only rational animal, no woman is a man, therefore women are not rational, right? We all booed at that. Um, that argument equivocates on the word man. If I say that man is the only rational animal, I'm using man in its uh, species sense, uh, mankind or humankind, but when I say no woman is a man, I'm using man in its more um, you know, sex or gender related uh, sense, um, male, male human. Okay. Well, materialists can claim that the term um, psychic phenomena itself equivocates. Okay, so perhaps the phrase uh, psychic phenomena um, shifts its meaning. So let's, and by the way, I don't have a precise definition of psychic phenomena. Um, I introduced this concept to you by giving you sort of a list of things like um, near-death experiences, uh, reincarnation, um, telepathy, ESP, that kind of stuff. So, however, if we do have the concept of psychic phenomena, a good enough grip on you know, what this is supposed to be like, Let's define strong psychic phenomena as psychic phenomena that can be explained only with souls. So if a strong psychic phenomenon really happens, the only way to explain how it happened would be to kind of make reference to uh, one or more souls. Clear? But maybe psychic phenomena means something weaker. Okay, maybe it means weak psychic phenomena. So weak psychic phenomena are psychic phenomena that can be explained in terms of the brain's biochemistry, for example. So a lot of people who, um, let's see, am I ready to do this? Um, a lot of people who think that near-death experiences happen, nevertheless think that they are merely weak psychic phenomena, um, and they give these sorts of physiological explanations here. A wide range of physiological theories of the near-death experience have been put, put forward, including those based upon cerebral hypoxia, anoxia, and hyper capnia, endorphins and other neurotransmitters and abnormal activity in the temporal lobes. So the idea here is these people are saying that we can explain why near-death experiences occur by talking about the biochemistry of the brain. Okay, so if near-death experiences are merely weak psychic phenomena, then they can be explained in terms of the brain's biochemistry, and similarly for the other, or, or, or you know, more generally given materialistic kind of explanations. Okay, so I'm going to run through sort of an evaluation of this argument from the materialist perspective and then kind of just invite you to think about it a little bit more deeply and form your own considered opinion on the issue, um, being open-minded to maybe future revisions of your opinion. Here's the idea. If strong psychic phenomena is used in this argument, materialists should deny premise one. In other words, they should deny that strong psychic phenomena occur. But if the argument uses weak psychic phenomena, if weak is used, materialists should deny premise two. Materialists should deny that if weak psychic phenomena occur, then people have souls, because weak psychic phenomena could be explained in terms of the brain's biochemistry. We can make all premises true by using weak in line one and strong in line two of that argument. Um, line one, premise one, would say weak psychic phenomena occur, which it's hard to argue with. Um, premise two, line two, would say if strong psychic phenomena occur, then there are souls. That's hard to argue with. But if we do that, the argument turns out not to be valid. It turns out invalid. And this might seem like a big bunch of uh, information to you. I'm going to go over each of these points 
uh, one by one. It won't take won't take more than a minute each one, and um, get a little bit clearer on that before finishing up. Okay. So here's what the argument looks like if strong psychic phenomena is used. Again, the, the idea here is that the, the phrase psychic phenomena has kind of a strong meaning and a weak meaning, right? Um, the strong meaning is that uh, strong psychic phenomena, the phenomena that can be explained only with souls. So this is what the argument looks like if strong psychic phenomena are used. Uh, strong psychic phenomena occur, and if they occur, then people have souls, blah, blah, blah. Um, I put premise one as red because in, in red, the materialist is just going to reject that strong psychic phenomena occur. Um, materialists will say, all the evidence we have to believe that psychic phenomena occur is simply evidence to believe that weak psychic phenomena occur and that we have no good evidence to believe that strong psychic phenomena occur. Um, some of the more far out stuff might be hoaxes or people deceiving themselves. Um, some of the more empirically well-confirmed stuff is just going to be weak psychic phenomena. Okay, so that's the materialist um, evaluation of this argument. This particular argument is unsound, according to the materialist, because premise one is false. Well, what if we use weak? The argument then looks like this. Weak psychic phenomena occur. Materialists are going to admit that. Weak psychic phenomena are things that can be explained by brain processes, the biochemistry, uh, you know, neurological processes in the brain, and, and related, maybe related physical processes. Premise two then goes on. If weak psychic phenomena occur, then people have souls. Well, there's no reason to accept that premise. The materialist is just going to deny that premise. Um, weak psychic phenomena, by definition, are phenomena that can be explained by the biochemistry of the brain. So their occurrence gives us no reason to believe that people have souls. So the materialist is going to say, this argument is unsound because premise two is false. What if we present a version of the argument where all the premises are true? Okay, and here it is. Premise one says that weak psychic phenomena occur. Okay, that's true. Lots of evidence for that. Premise two says if strong psychic phenomena occur, then people have souls. Okay, that's true. Even a materialist is going to admit that, right? It's, it's conditional. If strong psychic phenomena occur, then there are phenomena that can be explained only with souls, so therefore people have souls. Okay. Um, the problem here, obviously, I hope it's obvious, is that premise one and premise two do not have uh, the form of modus ponens premises, right? Premise one makes a claim, but premise two doesn't say if that claim, then another one. It says if a different one, then another one. So the argument is invalid. We cannot draw that final conclusion. In fact, from premises one and two, we can't draw the conclusion that people do have souls and hence we can't draw the conclusion that materialism is false. So, if we interpret the phrase psychic phenomena in such a way as to make all the premises of the argument true, we no longer have a valid argument, and hence we no longer have a sound argument against materialism. Okay. Um, by the way, here, here's a little hint, friendly hint. Um, this kind of methodology that I just ran through here yeah, whether you are persuaded by it or not, and I'm going to leave that to you, is, is the, but the general methodology, oh, if, if we use this sense of, of, of psychic phenomena, then this is wrong with the argument. If we use this other sense, then this, this other thing is wrong with the argument. And if we, if we let the argument equivocate, then, it, then it's not valid. Okay? This kind of um, methodology is going to be... Um, might be useful to you in doing this this quiz here. Okay, so this quiz is going to be a little bit more of an activity for you, a little bit more, um, but not much more of a challenge. But a, a li not much more work, not much more challenge. But a little bit of an activity. I I hope you have some fun with it. I I hope you kind of take it seriously. It should be fun. So here's here's quiz seven. Our quiz for this week. Um, and by the way. Um, there is handout 10 with the sort of the main points or highlights, um, which I mentioned last time in the last video. And these slides are available as well, including this slide, slide 27 with the quiz instructions and so on in um, this week's um, on-course topic. So, but 
I'll take two minutes and just uh, introduce it to you. So here's the instructions for this quiz. On the next slide, there's a short passage. The author argues against materialism. On the slide after that, there's an argument that you need to complete. Present the argument by filling in what's missing, filling in the blanks. The argument has a similar structure to Descartes' argument from doubt. It really has nothing to do with Descartes' argument from doubt, but the structure is similar. Um, premise 1, you know, part A, part B. Uh, if premise 1, then something else. After presenting the argument, you need to write something about it. Give brief explanations of its premises, evaluate it, or both. The more you write, um, the more you know, accurate it is, the, the better you're going to do on the quiz. Okay. You know what? Let me take a minute here. I'll read the passage. I'll, I'll get, let you get a, a, a preview, a head start on it here. Okay, someone wrote this passage. Let me tell you about my friend, Rocking Bob. He's great! He's generous. He's always there for his friends. He's honest, and he rocks. The only thing about Bob, though, is that his body isn't in the best shape. It has rashes, it's a bit chubby, pale, out of shape, not too easy on the eyes. Kind of like me. So believe me, Rockin' Bob is great. But Rockin' Bob's body is not great. But if this is true, then Rockin' Bob's not identical with his body. How could they be the very same, when one of them is great and the other is not? Moreover, of course, if Rockin' Bob's not identical with his body, then materialism is false. You know why, right? So we should reject the dangerous doctrine of materialism. I'll give you another little hint here. Um, view yourself as a sculptor, chipping away. The, the argument is kind of right all in there, but there's a lot of other stuff in there, too, that, you, that are really just explanations of the premises, or maybe just um, flourishes, rhetorical flourishes. So chip away stuff that's not premises of the argument, and you're going to wind up with the argument, and it's going to look something like this. So this is your, your job is to fill in these blanks here, and it's, it's, I hope it's not so challenging, but it's, I hope it's kind of interesting, too, to talk about. Fill in those blanks there so you get the argument, and um, here's what you do. In the week of April 6 through 10 on course topic, there is this assignment, and uh, I'm giving you a variety of ways, very flexible in how you submit it. You could upload a file to the Quiz 7 assignment if you want to do it, um, you know, uh, digitally and, you um, save it as a, you know, a PDF or a Word document and, and upload that. Or you could type the text directly into the assignment. Or you could just send me an email uh, of, your, of your quiz or share a Google Doc with me. Um, the email could even be a, a picture, a JPEG, or a picture of your handwritten assignment. That would be fine. I want to be as flexible as possible with this. I think that's it. Okay. So um, I'm going to sign off for now. Looking forward to um, maybe a discussion, forum discussion, or, uh, or chat about uh, the Rock and Bob argument.